Hello, I'm the Angry Spork. Earlier this year, we saw the Dark Knight become the target of a vicious killer from outer space, one that dismembers the strong and powerful. Even though that specific alien died for his failure, you know what they say, you can't keep a race of cosmic trophy hunters down. At least I think that's what they say. Anyway, I'm taking issue with Batman vs. Predator 2, and this time, bats won't be the only vigilante we see in this story. Let's start with issue number one and see if this comic makes us want to turn the page or turn our heads. The cover sees Batman and Huntress in one of her earlier costumes seeming to be prepared for danger. Bat seems to be shielding Helena, but at the same time almost looks like he's copping a feel. Thankfully this is post-crisis. Also in the background, behind several Gotham buildings, is the Predator. I guess one of them thought the only way to beat Batman was to strike a deal with Reader Repulsa and use her magic to make him grow to kaiju size. And of course, Batman's gonna beat him so easily because he's Batman. Written by Doug Monk, with art by Paul Galassi, Terry Austin, Todd Klein, Laverne Hinzershi, Carla Fini, and Digital Chameleon, we begin with Bats narrating about a heat wave hitting Gotham, as he approaches a pier in a rowboat. A regular, non-bat-themed rowboat? Bruce, is something wrong at home? Do you need to talk to someone? He's sneaking up on a drug deal, with the sellers allegedly selling something better and cheaper than a pusher named Manny Terraro. And the buyer turns out to be one of Manny's goons, revealing an empty suitcase that he shoots through to kill the competition. Bats figured he just lost Terraro's trail, so this catches him by surprise, and he returns the favor by bursting up from beneath the pier. Keep in mind, his launching point is a rowboat on the water, and he somehow manages to have enough force to not only break through a wooden surface that is designed for people to be walking and standing on for hours at a time a day, for years, and he still manages to launch into the air. But hey, it looks cool, so what do physics matter? I can't help but notice just how awkward the shooter looks here. He has this look of shock while he's firing. I'm not sure if he's nervous about the setup his boss put him on, or if he's just hearing the breaking lumber behind him. And even though he just cracked through solid wood, Bats is still somehow able to vault over the goon as he's turning around without being seen. It's true. Not strictly a modern disparity. The most human superhero here was breaking that very concept, even in the early 90s. The killer turns back again. You! Yes. And I hate guns. Boots are better. I mean, not if we're talking about projectile capabilities. Who throws a shoe? Honestly. And man, look at Bruce's midsection here. I know it's supposed to be muscle, but it looks more skeletal than anything else. Anyway, the beatdown occurs off-panel for the most part, watched by Huntress, who's heard about the same drug deal, but didn't arrive before Bats. He, meanwhile, starts asking about Tararo, but the gunman claims the Caped Crusader is marked. What do you mean? Permanently marked. This is the last suit you'll ever wear marked. You're a dead man marked. The goon pulls a smaller weapon from concealment. Just as pointy ears seems to jump clear, an arrow is fired. Right through the guy's wrist, pinning him to a post. Excuse me a moment. Ouch! Moving on. At first thinking maybe it was Oliver Queen, Despite the fact the arrow is yellow and not green, he realizes it's the Huntress. They argue a bit about how he doesn't accept her methods, and if she was going to model himself to any degree after Batman, she should do it right or not at all. He frees the gunman, and I won't show how, even though it kind of skirts being too graphic. Imagine this pen is the arrow. Batman just doesn't yank it through the arm. That caused too much damage. Instead, pulls the arm, passing the feathered end through. Maybe he couldn't break the arrow to make it less visceral, but still... Ow. 
Bats goes on that he could have disarmed the guy and gotten more information as he bandages the wound with the man's own bandana, just as he reaches for an ankle-mounted knife. Huntress raises her crossbow again, but of course our hero knew about the knife and effortlessly elbows the goon to sleepy land. Then we get this close-up of Helena. The shadowing on her face is very precise, shows off curves and contours, and I'm wondering if she's supposed to look like a specific real-life person here. Anyway, as their personalities continue to spar, Bats confirms the dealers are dead, and Huntress leaves, saying this isn't fun or sport for her, even if there's some satisfaction involved. We jump to an alien video screen, replaying the conclusion to the first crossover, from a ritual suicide of the beaten champion to Bruce reassuring Alfred the aliens wouldn't return. Meanwhile, at the contradiction... Just as a predator uses a bladed disc to decapitate a stylized Batman statue while heading towards Earth. They even recorded dialogue from outside the ship as they were leaving the planet. I guess they really wanted some bonus material for the DVD Blu-ray release. Hey, maybe the Bat statue came packaged with it. The fact that it exists at all shows predators do understand merchandising. They even recorded Alfred's pun about the Hunter's Moon. For a race of vicious killers, they've got great recording equipment. Bats wakes up the shooter, asking what he meant earlier about being marked. Turns out there's a big old free-for-all bounty on the bat, supposedly attracting the best killers in the world. So, it's Friday? Anyway, the Predator's ship, mistaken for a meteor by onlookers according to a convenient news report, finds a cliffside just beyond Gotham City limits, and laser carves a makeshift garage. Well, ooh la dee da, Mr. Frenchman. What do you call it? A car haul. As the Pred begins his hunt, the news continues about the double murder and apprehension of the offender, whose cooperation began and ended with saying Batman was dead meat. Like a hunted deer. Hey, there was a deer where the Predator landed. Now there's a thought. Note to self, call Disney about movie idea. Bambi vs. Predator. It'll probably end up more popular than their inevitable CG remake of the original Bambi cartoon anyway. We jump back earlier in the day, when Helena Bertinelli was in her classroom telling students why there was an empty desk today. A boy named Jamie Simmons died of an overdose. The other kids look sullen and mournful while Bertinelli tears up, hoping there's a lesson for everyone in all this. Jamie wasn't a dropout or one of the criminals shooting each other over poisons, but it was Tararo's drugs that killed him, and that's why Huntress is after the ganglord. Batman is driving along in his signature car, musing on the price on his cowl, just as a faceless assassin is trying his hand on collecting, though a cloaked predator gets the jump on him. Huh. Got a beat on the Batmobile pretty quick. It's not like he had any special tracker or high-tech equipment or even social media posts to work off of. Given those other stories I've reviewed on this show where someone was tracking Batman's car, it makes those efforts seem all the less impressive. Batman figures there's not much he can do about the bounty except to be prepared for any takers. You know, the thing he's known for already. So does that mean nothing really changes for him? Does it mean that it really is just Friday? Two men, Lou sitting in the chair and Frank standing up, go over some files obtained through a source in the Bureau, possibly meaning the FBI. It's all information on the killers looking to cash in on the Dark Knight's death, including our recently deceased shooter, a rat-faced guy that'll use anything he can as a deadly weapon, and a scantily clad woman that uses only sex and martial arts as weapons, and is more interested in the challenge than money. So basically, she's what Lady Shiva would have been had she been New 52'd by Scott Lobdell and Jim Lee. In addition to a proficient knife user, a jittery explosives expert, and a former pro wrestler slash biker, it's looking like a veritable League of Assassins. Though careful Rachel Ghoul might have that copyrighted. All but assuring Bats' death and making Tararo very happy. Weird thing is, now these guys' names have switched. Lou is standing and Frank is in the chair. Looks like quite the mix-up. Instead of finding out how these men are connected to the elusive mobster, we go to the owner of the rooftop pigeon coop, finding his cage is destroyed. Oh, and a naked headless corpse. 
The Predator, meanwhile, has found the bat signal, firing at the hinges with his shoulder cannon. It's by no means a silent operation, as the police inside hear the commotion and head to the roof, armed. Gordon recognizes the creature, from his dialogue seems to think that it's the same creature from the first crossover, maybe Bats didn't tell him about what happened in the end, and they open fire as it cloaks. And surprisingly, Jim does not go deaf from having all that gunfire around his head. Several officers are felled in the Predator's counterattack, and Gordon orders retreat, with himself and two other officers holding position in the landing in case they're pursued. As the creature begins taking his trophies, Jim orders the survivors not to speak of this to anyone. Oh yes, we wouldn't want people knowing that there's another space hunter in Gotham. Then word might spread to the dozen or so superheroes that could capture him in minutes, and we might have a reduced loss of life. <laughs> and that would be downright nutty. Jim's certain the monster just wants to use the signal to lure in Gotham's biggest trophy, and that it won't bother chasing the three of them. And that's when the Predator busts down the door. Don't you ever get tired of being wrong all the time? Sometimes. It sets off an explosion that takes out the stairs and knocks the cops back while he makes off with the signal, carrying it like it was an oversized frisbee. He gets a couple of blocks before he spots someone in a cape. Huntress, investigating a pool hall where the killer goon from the beginning hung out, and hopes to get a lead on Terraro. Through a skylight, she sees Frank and Lou, who apparently switched names back, when the Pred clocks her from behind. She's so stunned she can't open her eyes, but is conscious, just enough that she can tell she's being studied. And in that outfit, she's probably having unpleasant flashbacks to certain people at comic conventions. Being compared to the Bat, the space assailant finds a negative match and leaves her. Whoever it is could kill me, but instead thrown away. Rejected? Well, that's a fine how do you do. I am just as valid a crime fighter as Batman, so I demand that you run me through with your blade and decapitate me right now. Wait a minute. Just as Helena's eyes begin opening and barely able to make out her attacker, the mobsters open fire, having heard a noise from the roof, probably her being tossed aside. Apparently taking this as a challenge, the Predator targets them and earns himself two more kills. And here's something that caught my eye. A shard of glass with a bullet hole through it. I would figure that wouldn't be possible, that it would just have shattered and the hole wouldn't be intact, for lack of a better word. But maybe there's some types of tempered glass where that's possible. Over the police radio, Batman hears about gunshots at the pool hall and trouble at police headquarters, engaging his rocket booster to get to one of those locations, as Huntress makes her way to the skylight to see what happens when you fire on a predator, or open fire in the vicinity of a predator. Seriously, it's a good thing this isn't happening during 4th of July festivities or this guy wouldn't know what to do with himself. Heck, someone in my neighborhood seems to look for any excuse to set out fireworks, and they'd be a prime target for the Predator on New Year's Eve, someone's graduation, probably talk like a pirate day. Batman enters the office through a door. So did he go through the entrance of the pool hall and make his way up or what? Also, getting serious Keaton vibes from this panel. Anyone else? Anyway, he recognizes the methodology, and Huntress drops from the roof to ask what happened. He's being vague while she's still feeling woozy from her attack, and then the bat signal lights up the sky, but from across the river. Bats takes off while Helena loses her grip, her rear end slamming to the floor, but managing to avoid all that broken glass. She's about to pass out and miss whatever it is Batman was talking about. He's hearing a report about the return of the see-through slasher as Jim Gordon is placed in an ambulance, pleading to get word to his caped friend that the signal is a trap, while being given painkillers. The issue closes with a shot of the Predator at the mouth of his cave, holding up the signal. Eh, you ain't so big, you're not the only one with a bat signal. Tune in next week to see if Batman survives, or if it turns out that the past two and a half decades of continued Batman comics have all been a dream. I'm the Angry Spork, and man have I got issues.